So good afternoon, everyone. It, it really is terrific to see yet another full house for the UM Real Estate Impact Conference. Nine years ago, Kislak, along with Douglas Elliman and Wickoff, signed on as the presenting sponsors of what has become one of the hottest tickets in town. Believe it or not, the first conference had about 30 students and 60 guests and only five sponsors, and obviously look around at what we've created. Um, if you take a moment to look in your book, if you look at the middle section, you're gonna see a who's who on the sponsors list of commercial real estate. And so we, we, we thank the sponsors very much. There's a couple of boards involved in the business school that are really involved in this conference, and I want to thank my fellow Miami Herbert Business School Real Estate Advisory Board members and the Masters in Real Estate Development Plus Urbanism Board for, uh, for your contributions. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Swire Properties for sponsoring the Scholars Luncheon for the sixth year in a row. Uh, very nice thing that we do for the students. And um, let me just say the generosity of all of the people involved, and if I haven't thanked you yet, thank you. Um, it, that, that makes this an invitation-only event, um, and you know, a lot, a lot of these, event, these types of things are, are pretty high-dollar high things. So um, thank you again for everybody that's involved. Um, the students, if you're a student or a prospective student, can you stand up, please? Let's give them a hand. So um, it's, it's great to give them a real-world opportunity, uh, you know, network, do, do, do you know, meet, meet the students, please. And at Kislak, we, do, we definitely believe in supporting real estate education and the students. Um, we've hired uh, some UM grads. We've, we've had them in as interns. It's been an uh, excellent experience, and many of the people out there have done so as well. And if you have a job opening, you know, please, please consider these students to fill them. Um, Alumni, can the alumni stand up? I think we got about 100 alum. It's great to have you back. <laughs> so there are prospective grad students in the audience and we really hope that this experience helps you uh, to make the decision to join the, the UM family. Um, a little off real estate for just a second, uh, Kislak also su supports the UM libraries and we established the Kislak Center at, at UM at the Richter Library. If, uh, next time you're on campus, love to see you get by that, that part of campus and, and visit that center. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff over there. And uh, we, we did endow a Kislak chair related to that material and that, that really, I, I think, helps uh, contribute to President Frank's initiative of of establishing 100 new endowed uh, positions by UM Centennial in 2025. So if you're thinking about that, I'm sure that uh, somebody would love to talk to you. <laughs> University of Miami is, is definitely one of Miami's crown jewels. Uh, this conference, I, I believe, is, is the highlight of the conference season. Uh, and we're honored to have uh, President Frank here, here, and I'd like to introduce him. Uh, President Frank is a scholar and leader in higher education and global health. He became the sixth president of the University of Miami in 2015. Uh, he holds three academic appointments as professor of public health sciences, health sector management and policy, and sociology. He previously served as the dean of Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and as minister of the of public health of, of Mexico, he reformed the nation's health system and expanded access to health care for previously uninsured Mexicans. He also led the National Institute of Public Health of Mexico and has held top positions at the World Health Organization and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others. Please join me in welcoming President Frank. Thank you, Tom, for your very kind introduction, and thank you for all the support from Jay Kislak and the Kislak organization. It's, it's been a tremendous legacy um, that, that, that you've 
are helping to build. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the University of Miami ninth annual Real Estate Impact Conference. Thank you, thank you to all of you for joining us uh, today. As you know, as you've heard, this event is hosted by the university's uh, School of Architecture and by the Miami Herbert Business School. And I want to acknowledge uh, the school's leadership, uh, Dean Rudy Ru Rudolph L. Curry from the School of Architecture and Dean John Quelch of the Miami Herbert Business School. And we also have a growing participation of our School of Law, both uh, in terms of faculty and students, many of whom I had the pleasure of meeting just uh, a, a few moments ago, and Dean Anthony Verona from the law school is also here with us. I wanna also take this opportunity to acknowledge our alumni. We're very proud of you. Uh, you are the face of the University of Miami in the larger world, and very specially I acknowledge some of our uh, me members of our board of trustee. I see Leonard Aves here and others who may, may be in the audience Thank you all for being, for being uh, with us today. Um, the University of Miami is really very strongly committed to the idea of interdisciplinary collaboration because problems have become way too complex for any particular area of, uh, of knowledge and endeavor to be able to tackle them. And so this is an example of an incredibly productive uh, relationship, engagement among three of our schools, the Business School, the School of Architecture, and the School of Law. Uh, and then, of course, this conference is also made possible through the partnership of our very generous spo sponsors to whom we are extremely grateful. And speaking of generosity, um, in addition to what you just he he uh, heard about the Kislak organization, I wanted um, you to, uh, everyone here to, to know, and many of you do know, that just last year, 2019, the university received a transformational gift from two remarkable alumni who graduated from our business school more than half a century ago. That's Alan and Patty Herbert. So in recognition of that incredibly generous gift, the School of Business is now the Miami Herbert Business School. And it was named in honor and recognition of a gift that's in going to empower the school to achieve its vision uh, to discover and disseminate transformative business knowledge in order to advance sustainable prosperity worldwide. It's also going to support the school's mission to solve some of today's most complex problems, as I was saying, specifically supporting this idea of interdisciplinary clusters that attract and retain premier faculty and students, and that help to advance the economy both in South Florida and across the United States and indeed the global economy. In addition, it, it will allow the Miami Herbert Business School to enhance existing initiatives in healthcare and real estate, two industries that, as all of you know, are central to the regional economy. I, I mention all of this because it is a tremendous source of pride for the university, but also because a successful investment in commercial real estate was the source of the funds for the Herbert's most recent gift to the U. Of course, I am sure that all of you already know about the benefits of investing in real estate, and here we have an additional investment. And I'd like to thank the Miami Herbert Business School and again the, the, the Schools of Architecture Real Estate Advisory Boards for all their continued financial support to this conference and for all the other ways in which they enhance UM's educational real estate programs. Since the university is a private, not-for-profit research institution, philanthropy, such as the Herberts, help us to deliver innovative academic programs like the master's program in sustainable business at the Miami Herbert Business School and the master's of professional science in urban sustainability and resilience, which is a joint program between the School of Architecture and the College of Arts and Sciences. The U is proud to take the lead role in the study of sustainable practices given our location in this very vibrant but also vulnerable place that is South Florida. And finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Heinz for their sponsorship of the annual Heinz Development Competition that focused on Miami this year, specifically on the area just north of downtown Miami. The Heinz Competition focused the attention of graduate real estate students from all over the country right here in our own backyard. 
I'm sure that most of the students who worked on projects for the Heinz competition would love to be here right now, and we hope they will be here in, in, in the future. The Real Estate Impact Conference continues a long tradition of thought leadership at UM, and I hope that all of you will gain very valuable insights from this afternoon's uh, keynote speakers, and of course that you will gain a lot in the networking activities that are so central to conferences like that. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce, introduce Matt Cherwin, Managing Director, Treasurer and Chief Investment Officer at J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company, and Steve Whitcoff, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Whitcoff, who will moderate the discussion. Thank you again for being here. Hi, um, my name is Steve Whitcoff. I have the, um, the pleasure of uh, moderating my very good friend, Matt Sherwin, who is the uh, treasurer and chief investment officer of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. But before I begin, Matt, with the questions, just a brief uh, anecdotal data point on real estate. I am now a, uh, proud to be a blessed mem uh, member of, uh, uh, of the Miami community. I have moved down here full time. I'm more, I'm more saying this for my father, though. May he rest in peace. My sneakers are not my attempt to be Miami cool. It's because I have an ankle brace on my left ankle. So <laughs> just, just wanted to make that statement. Matt, this is a real estate conference, um, and we're all interested in I think your view of the world. So m most of the questions are gonna, are gonna center on that. Um, supply chains in the world today are totally correlated and clearly they're very constrained and demand is way down. So those two factors are causing some real toxicity. Could you tell the audience your, your view of what's happening out there through your looking glass? So I do a lot of these, <coughs> excuse me, I do a lot of these kinds of panels through either work or external, and I guess like a little tip is like usually start with like a warm-up question. Like that was like, you know. Um, but I do want to say just, a, you know, a, a couple things. I'm, you know, very happy to be here today, and uh, there's got to be a hundred people in the audience who would be more insightful and more interesting speakers than myself, but this is where we are, so this is what you get. Um, I've got uh, one little prop that I'm going to use, uh, or a couple tidbits that I dug out. But I would say I'm very um, happy to be here. I, I love Miami. Um, it's uh, you know such a great city with such a diverse culture of art, music. Um, you know, as a, as someone who grew up just outside of Boston, I appreciate a city that loves its sports teams, all of them. Um, and uh, it's just such a, a wonderful, wonderful city. And uh, for us as a company. Uh, Florida is very important to J.P. Morgan. We have um, over 400 branches in Florida. We have 78 in Miami alone. Um, our Advancing Cities initiative um, participates with uh, some of your wonderful initiatives, such as uh, 305 Resiliency, the South Florida Housing Collaborative Link. Um, these uh, great efforts work to develop sustainable, affordable housing, um, housing uh, awareness and education. So, you know, it's a really wonderful uh, place for the company as well. And I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very important clients of J.P. Morgan Chase is in the audience as well. So my privilege to, uh, to be here. It reminds me of when you see the sort of the American Idol video and they say, like, if the mic goes out, just keep on talking, right? Um, so, I, uh, a couple little fun facts, though, that I brought out was I, I looked up because I figured, like I said, I. I would not be interested in hearing me speak. I would be very interested in hearing you speak. So I have a, just a little bit of filler that I dug out is, so JP Morgan has uh, either, has over 5,000 branches, or right about 5,000 branches in the US. We own or lease 74 million square feet of real estate. That is the equivalent of 27 Empire State Buildings. Our 1,800 elevators annually travel the distance of from Earth to the Moon three times. Uh, we have 300,000 parking spaces uh, under our management, which is 10 times Disney. Uh, so it gives you a sense of the scale, and we partner with a lot of people in this audience um, in those properties. 
Um, some we own, some we lease, um, some we work with people uh, like yourselves on. Um, so real estate is uh, very important to the company just alongside um, Florida and South Florida per um, in particular. So I brought something that I think would be pretty interesting, like I said, uh, anything I could use to fill it with something more interesting. I brought something that I think would be interesting to watch just for, it's, it's like two or three minutes long, um, is for those of you who've been to Midtown New York any time recently, you would know that we are currently um, building a new corporate headquarters. And we are in the process of systematically dismantling the current 1.5 million square foot building, which is on 47th and Park Avenue, sits on top of the Grand Central Station train sheds. And it is, to my understanding, the largest purposeful demolition ever done in this country. Um, so if we can cue that, we've got a little video that I think is fun to watch. No one has attempted to take a building of this height down like this in New York City ever. The demo of 270 Park is the largest demo in the history of New York. They're saying this is the tallest building ever voluntarily demolished. The location of this project brings on a unique group of safety precautions that we have to put in place here. The magnitude of people around and the heavy population, if you just look around the building, the extra protection with the sidewalk sheds, the scaffold that's up the side of the building. In addition to everything else, we are on top of Metro North dealing with the train yard. OK, and we're going to pick the generator off the roof. The coordination between the Department of Buildings, the DOT, North Star Tishman, and J.P. Morgan Chase is enormous. North Star, over the past year, has been working towards stripping this entire building out of furniture, carpet, ceiling, sheetrock, electrical, mechanical, you name it. We're dismantling the building instead of wrecking the building. That's what we're doing. 53 floors, you have a million and a half square foot. One of the things that J.P. Morgan was very insistent on was recycling, taking out mainly for reuse and then recycling secondly. In addition to that, all the generators were all shipped to South America to help other areas in need of power. The hardest part of the interior demo so far is removing the glass because of the height and the wind and everything. It's a challenge. On the other side of the building, the tower crane's going up at the same time, and there's a lot of pieces to it. These pieces are put in very systematically, one by one, including bracing, but it's a very long, detailed process. Being at 53 stories, you really need a way to lift your dumpsters or your concrete cans, your metal cans, from the ground to the roof and then back. The crane operator has one of the most important roles on this project, moving material up and down the building. Without him, the project duration could be doubled, tripled, and he is one of the most important players on this project. When you're bringing a team of this size together, we wanted to make sure that we really employed the best of the best. This project, in a holistic view, has to be employing upwards of 1,000 people. This is like my family away from home. I've seen these people every day, sometimes six days a week, seven days a week. Continuing through 2020, the tower continues to come down. The completion date for the tower is January 15th of 21. This is something that's never been done before, and people know that, and they want to be a part of it. This is a historic moment for New York City. So I thought, you know, who better than you guys? I think, to my understanding, you're the first people outside the company to see this video so far. We saw it ourselves just recently. And uh, so I, when I was coming down here, I said, you know, I, I, I think this group will be interested. I got to get my hands on the, on the video. So it took a little arm twisting, but it is amazing to watch. Like, I, there's a lot of, you know, uh, development professionals in the room. I myself have never seen a crane 
hoisted dumpster 50 feet in the air. I mean, it's something really like you kind of like naturally go back to the other side of the street because you're just like, you're pretty sure they have it under control, but just in case, you, you kind of take a, step, a couple steps back. It is amazing to watch. And I think my, my favorite part of it as, uh, as someone who I'm, didn't uh, grow up in New York, but I've worked in New York for the last 23 years, was uh, on 9-11, the construction team hung a, must have been 150 foot wide American flag on that uh, crane base that you saw going up. And it was just, it was awesome. So um, a couple years from now, uh, they'll be going up instead of going down and um, we'll, we'll see how it all turns out. But um, I, you know, I love watching that video and just seeing the community that's come together to help us bring it to life. Um, so I think Steve was asking kind of like, what's the answer to what's happening right now? Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated question. We, um, what the, the way that we look at a lot of these situations is, um, I would tell you sort of like if we want to roll back a few weeks, the kind of dialogue that we were hearing, and you can kind of connect that um, with your own and how you're thinking about things now is um, 50 basis points, 60 basis points ago on the 10-year note, which to some people in the room sounds like a lot and some it doesn't, but it's a lot. Um, people were saying like, oh, this is no different than um, the seasonal flu. Whatever the number is, you know, 150,000 people per year get the seasonal flu. This is a flu. This is not a big deal. Maybe the market will rally five basis points. I think we heard that three days later, three days later, three days later. Um, and the way that I think about things, the way that we think about things a lot at, at J.P. Morgan is in some ways, um, in some ways, I am employed to try and think about what's going to, to figure out what's going to happen next. Um, we have under, what I do for a living is manage our $2.7 trillion balance sheet. Um, and we could talk about that a bit later. But um, there's some portion of what you're doing, which is, what do I think is going to happen? And then there's some portion, and you have to have conviction around that. But there's some portion of what you're doing, which is, what might happen? And am I prepared for that? Because a big part of my job is making sure our, my function impacts what we actually earn. Another big part of it is making sure that we have the capital where we need it, when we need it, that we have the cash where we need it, when we need it. Um, I think we do a trillion of payments per day. Um, so when we talk about like what's going to happen, and my traders are telling me, um, you know, I think there's you know five or six basis points uh, left to go here, and you're kind of stepping back and you're thinking like. I, I just don't really understand that perspective. How can you tell me that you know what's going to happen? Because I can tell you that if this happens, here's how I'm going to feel. And if that happens, here's how I'm going to feel. So am I prepared for that? Half the job is making sure you're prepared for those sorts of situations, uh, prepared to serve your customers, prepared for the right economic out outcomes. And a lot of times you sort of talk yourself into, here's what I think is going to happen, because that's what you want to happen. Right? And hope is a horrible, horrible strategy. Um, I'm not an economist. Um, another reason why I think you know, me talking about this stuff is maybe not the right person, but I'm not an economist. Um, I'm not a quant. Uh, I, what, I, what I can do, though, is sort of speak to those kinds of people and to, you know, I, I grew up as a, as a mortgage bond trader, so like HR would send us these interns and they're like, you know, here's this person, he's brilliant and he, you know, went to Harvard and he's an astrophysicist, he can't talk to humans, but you'll love him. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they sort of thought that, you know, oh, okay, send him to the mortgage guys, right? But on some much more simple premise and these, some people we would just send right back and say like, this isn't gonna work. And they're like, but NASA is trying to hire this person. I'm like, well, they should, because that's a little bit more of a, um, like, that's a little bit more of a defined thing. Like, do you have enough propulsion to lift this rocket? Like, um, you know, is this battery large enough to actually lift this car? Uh, but when someone tells you that they've calculated that the maximum price on this is 102, and therefore, and you're like, that's great, that's a good guiding piece of information, except I just paid 103 because I know I can sell it at 104. Like, there is a part where you bring reality um, into that function and into that math. And, and that's what we're looking at now. We have um, a lot of people sitting back and saying, um, well, the Fed is saying that um, we're going to wait and see. We're going to wait and see what the data is. And to some extent, you're saying, like, well, wait and see what? Like, a bunch of this has happened. It's the horse is out of the barn. When we talk about how will the virus 
um, affect our economy. Just look around and, and, and what's happening. So uh, as an example, you start to hear more and more. It's, when we talk about will it spread to other countries, it has already, and that's inevitable, and it will continue to. And the more that you have sort of a proactive, prophylactic response to that, the more you are locking in an economic outcome. So when the Fed's saying that they're going to wait and see uh, what data is, I think now the market might be pricing in an 80% chance that they ease at the March 17th meeting. And this is just a week or two after you had senior Fed officials saying, we're going to wait and see how the data comes in. Uh, but when you have um, the London schools, what they call half term, um, they were coming back from their vacations just recently, and uh, kids were coming back and getting sick right away, and some of the London schools shut down. Like, you're steps away from, this is a warmer climate down here, and I think people are, we hear a lot about, and oh, not only am I not an economist, I'm definitely not an epidemiologist, but anyways, um, we hear a lot of people, but to that point, it's about being prepared and what's gonna happen. Um, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, when the weather warms up, this is gonna go away. It's gonna run its course. But I have a hard time marrying that with um, how it's popping up in South Korea and Singapore, which to m last time I checked are pretty hot, like now. So I don't, maybe it would be worse if the weather wasn't gonna turn, but it, it's happening. And when you talk about airlines um, um, pulling back, now they're pulling back because there's no demand. They were pulling back because they were for precautionary measures. Corporations are pulling back on non-essential travel uh, on the plane down this morning. I made the mistake of watching CNBC on the whole plane ride home, on uh, um, the plane ride down this morning. I should just not. But um, Japan Disney's closed for the next two weeks. Like these things become, you can just stack them up and you can say, what are the known events here? Um, the market is already pricing in uh, that the Fed uh, is going to kind of cut 100 basis points over uh, the next couple of quarters. Um, this is a light year away from what we were pricing in. Uh, just a, a few weeks ago even. And when you look at this and, and you hear people say like, oh, this is crazy. And you're like, I don't know, what does that mean? Like, I hate when people say like, this is crazy. It's crazy because you wanted to buy it cheaper two weeks ago? Or what exactly is crazy about X, Y, Z? People are kind of think default to that sort of, um, that way of thinking about things uh, pretty quickly. And it, it's really not when you, when you think about we were on a place where the economy was you know, good, but a little bit um, loosely knit on, and, you know, inflation has been ephemeral for quite some time, and, you know, yes, we've had blips to higher rates, but any kind of rate expectations, oh, rates are going higher, and six months later, and six months later, and six months later, you can do that um, for years and years and years, so expectations uh, are very different than, than what's happened, and when people say it's crazy, you're like, well, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel good when the Dow goes down a thousand points by the time you've finished your breakfast. It doesn't feel good when this, you know, when I get up at 4.15 in the morning and the first thing I do is kind of check Bloomberg markets um, on my Blackberry, if you still call them that. Um, and when you see what's happening in the markets, that doesn't feel good. But what's crazy about it? Last year, S&P was up 30%. Earnings were up 1%. 99% of that was, an ex was multiple expansion. Okay, so this is what, so is it crazy that, we're, that equities are down 15%? Well, we're only just kind of retraced half of where we were before. The moves that we're seeing are very similar in size to in December 2018. If you remember, I remember being on uh, a vacation with my family in Tokyo and every day kind of picking it up and seeing Dow was down 700 and just kind of putting it down and then, you know, going out for the day and sort of, hoping, which I said is a bad strategy, but hoping you come back and it says something different when you're done from some of your sightseeing. But we went through a very similar pullback for different reasons um, in 2018. Right now, equity markets have pulled back about 15% over the last handful of days. We did that over the course of December 2018. We did that in 2016 as well. And if you add to that that we're doing it from higher levels, that the nominal levels that we were pulling back from in the moves in 2018 and 2016 were significantly lower than where we were. And this isn't to me saying, uh, this is me saying, oh, things are going down quite a bit from here, uh, but they certainly could. And it's just a range of outcomes that we need to look at. Right now, the market's pricing in, I think it's a 25% probability that uh, Fed funds goes to zero before the end of the year. 
Uh, and these are, these are like, so it's not just about, you know, what it has, but it's the conditional probabilities that people are building in. So when Stephen asks about supply chain, um, we have to think about things. When, when we had um, SARS, the purchases that were in the system were a lot more like capital development, infrastructure spending. Those were things that you were going to sort of do uh, when you got back online. And to some extent, if you were going to buy like a new black Nissan and then you find out that you can't get it for another three or four weeks, when they come in, you're probably going to make that purchase again. Although autos are one of the leading indicators of consumer sentiment. Like when you feel safe in your job, you feel comfortable, that's when people buy uh, a new car. But when presented with the opportunity to get the shiny black new Nissan that you had wanted in the first place, now that you've waited five or six weeks, you probably make that same purchase. But the person who deferred their um, February school vacation is not then going to take two vacations, like the kids don't get out of school again later when things uh, have hopefully gone back to normal. So there's a whole set of discretionary purchases which just go away. And the economy that we're, and the activity that we have is right now based on a lot more of discretionary service-based consumption rather than um, capital expenditures and infrastructure spending and development. So it's a very different, it's hard to make a comparison to 2003, 2004. It's a very different um, type of economy. Globally, things were much more loosely knit. Um, so we think about, uh, and, and I think people were very quick to say like, uh, well, this may have a half a point GDP drain in one quarter, but it'll just be a half a point more in the next. So this is just about the passage of time. I personally don't really subscribe to that. Um, I think what we, I'll tell you what I think is happening and then I'll tell you what I worry about. I think what we have is what a lot of people would just describe as more like a U. You know, we, we came down, we waited, we go back. What I worry about is that those, you know, the wings of that are not parallel. And then you have some things are, which are, are symmetrical, I think is the right word that I should use, that uh, your forward looking upward sloping part, wherever you say that is gonna happen, is not the same steepness as how you came down. And is there something lost in the process there? And that's what I think we should be just as, uh, I think there's two pieces to it. Uh, the one that is, does the Fed have any more bullets? Will this be effective? That's why they are more likely than not to act fast and hard. Um, so that is definitely something that the market talks a lot about, but then you have to, for me, when I see images of people lining up for flights when they're getting um, their biothermal screened, um, when they're getting off flights, you have to think just in general, like there will be a process to this. Unfortunately, lives will be lost. Hopefully, medicine and science will help containment on this hopefully good process and getting ahead of this in the schools and communities will, will, will mitigate the circumstances. But what I wonder a little bit is, will this change how we clean concert venues, clean schools, the boarding procedures for airplanes, things like that, that add just cost in general? And I think why that's really important is we were not at, say, like 4% GDP and burning hot and had room to, to give something up. We were in this, like, what people like to call a little bit of a Goldilocks, where they say, you know, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. This is great. I'm getting low rates to borrow, but I'm still making money. Um, and how much room did you really have in there? And if you had an economist up here, they would tell you not much. They would say that when they would talk about inflation and they would say we're at 1.8%, 1.6%, depending on what metric they're saying, you're saying, well, the Fed says we're supposed to be at two. That sounds pretty close. Like in the world for an economist, 1.6% inflation and 2% inflation are light years apart. Now you have the Fed is talking about actually what we wanna do is we wanna to move to a new framework where instead of trying to get to 2%, and historically the Fed has always been about making sure inflation doesn't get out of hand. What they've been talking about for a long time is we're gonna let it run hot. We've been under for so long. We're gonna move to, and there were Fed presidents and Fed governors who were talking about this a couple of years ago and they were sort of like, you know, the crazy ones in the room, but it's a little bit more consensus at the Fed now that we should overshoot get back to some sort of average. So then if you say, you know what, we were kind of loosely knit on getting back to our target, well, we're gonna switch to a new framework where what we'd wanna do is go over our target a little bit to have a little catch up, get a little momentum. And now we're having a systemic shock that maybe takes us back a step. It has to make you one, like when you talk about the 10-year note is at um, 
1.15%. Oh my God, that's crazy. So, but why? What, what one of my biggest pet peeves is, I'm doing, helping you because now I'm like cutting down, you only have to ask two more questions for the whole remaining time. Um, one of, uh, like, I think my ultimate pet peeve for the last 10 years is when people say, given where we are in the cycle, so like, please tell me where we are in the cycle. I would love to know. Okay, as, a, as someone who grew up trading, not grew up, but for a part of my career, traded residential mortgage credit, subprime mortgage loans, and you know, I, the, so many times I've heard people say, we're in the seventh inning of this. You have people who, I, and it's funny, like we are, one of our co-presidents is British, and he was saying, he was doing this analogy, and he was like, actually, I don't really know how many innings are in a baseball game, but I know it's at least five, so like, here's how, what inning I did. But in 2009, people were like, oh, we're in the sixth inning of this. So the Fed was on hold for 10 years. So what does that mean, like where we are in the cycle? And what we like to say is, and what some economists probably would say, but we like to say is, Cycles don't die of old age. So this idea that we've had a long economic expansion and therefore we should have a recession, like you guys would know better than myself, but a recession, that's a, that's a defined academic, academic term. So what we're, we're talking about is high growth versus low growth. Japan has recessions, they start from a low level, so it's easier for them to go below zero. But whether, like, what is it, the National Bureau of Economics tells us, you know, six months after the fact that we had a recession, has, like, is not going to help me manage through, the session, re, the, through a recession. Uh, but where we are in the cycle, um, and when we compare to, oh, well, last time, and when we talk about, oh, when the Fed hikes rates, so in 2003 and in 1994, and I'm thinking, so, okay, so you have, like, two to three data points that we're comparing to, and we're using the ones like before the internet, the ones with like limited computer adoption, like how are those in any rel way relevant? Like how about we actually just say, we don't really know. But what does end in expansion, if you look back on them quite often, are the unforeseen systemic shock. It's the things that people weren't really prepared for, the things that you couldn't see, and we don't know what this is gonna look like, but we do know much more so this week and by next week, it, this will be like it's this will be locked in already. You are seeing this week, uh, things are being. Sh what's the best way to say it? Pro we're seeing proactive shutdowns, and you are. Um, this is not by choice, but you are by definition uh, removing economic activity, and it's going to be more and more next week and the week after. And uh, you know, I would say that uh, Northeast schools are like on the on the cusp of. Um, evaluating whether they should close and what the triggers are for that. Um, we are already having our schools tell us, like, please report your travel. Um, we have checked out the, the students who've been to Italy. We have checked out who's been on vacation. I told you already a bunch of the London schools. The kids came back, and then they actually closed them. Uh, so when you look at, it's a little bit hard to say, let's look at a certain company and say, well, you basically had a, an 18% pullback in this company. That's $30 billion of market cap. Did they just lose $30 billion of net income over the next couple of years based on what happened? Most likely not. But if you want to actually put what happened kind of in the six to nine months before that, they had like maybe even a much larger uh, market cap expansion. So what we had going on for the last 12 months was people saying, I feel comfortable the economy is stable. I feel comfortable we're having income um, from these companies, and there aren't great investment alternatives. We see 32% of sovereign debt is negative yielding right now. Um, what are my investment alternatives? It's, a, at the time, a 2% 10-year note, or a, a company uh, that will make this over time. I feel comfortable that my required returns have lowered. And for all the um, you know, students in the room and the prospective students, I remember... Um, and I went to an undergrad business school, didn't happen to be this one, but uh, in Finance 102 was, what's the maximum price of a bond? Like, I hope that they've revised that question. Because that was always just, oh, this is a trick question for the people who don't have friends that already did this class last semester. And the answer is, it's the principal plus the sum of the coupons, because you can only have a discount rate that goes to zero. 
The yield on a bond can only be zero. So you get principal, you get it back, you get coupon payments, add them up. That's your maximum price of a bond. Good. Now we're going to talk about bond math and discounted cash flows. And this was the framework that was taught and didn't really contemplate negative yields, right? So um, all of these things, I think, are an expansion of like the what if, the probability. Right now, there's a big question as to whether the Fed uh, is allowed to um, pass negative rates. Uh, they definitely don't want to. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a murky area as to whether they are allowed to. And how do you as a bank then implement that? Do we charge you, do we charge you minus 50 basis points on your savings account? I would say in some other countries, people are now being charged a negative rate on, on their account. But you could do like what we used to do. I remember when I first started working at what was then Smith Barney in their fixed income division, um, there was a Chase, brand, and I have a Chase account, um, but it's also because uh, I didn't have to pay the $5 monthly fee if I got direct deposit because it was a Chase branch in the 390 Greenwich uh, building, which is still Citigroup's uh, corporate headquarters. But um, we, do you go back to that? Do you say, well, let's charge five bucks a month on your account? Well, what about the people who have more money in their account? It's a sort of a high class problem. But you have people, you'd be like, well, to get to minus 50 basis points, I'd have to charge you $50,000 a month for your bank account. And then what's that person do? Well, I'll just take it in cash. Really, like, if those were the balances we were talking about, does not really equate to uh, taking home, like, if anyone wants to Google, like, I think we did this after we watched Ocean's Eleven, but, like, we Googled, like, how much does a million dollars weigh? And I think it's 55 pounds. But, like, when you see them walking out of the casino, you're like, these numbers don't have, sorry, like, I'm a bean counter, you know? Like, I watch a movie, and that's what I do. Like, when I'm in a casino, like, I count other people at the chips ta uh, table's chips. Um, if you ever sat down with me at a poker table in a casino, I would know everyone at the table um, and how much they had. And not because I have like the kind of rain man thing that like I sit down and see the colors, but like literally you, they have them in stacks and each stack is 20 chips and you just do the math. But like, so I think of the world of kind of numbers like that. And when we look at the numbers of what's happening, there's economic activity that is being changed right now. And so we just try to expand our thinking a little bit. I would love to have a V-shaped recovery, love to. But what if we don't? What are we earning on our balance sheet? What are we paying our customers? Are we going to lend? Um, I think there were some people had submitted some questions ahead of time on um, what does this mean for commercial real estate markets? What does it mean for uh, CMBS? I think right before this happened, I would say commercial real estate markets, anyone who said like, oh, these are overvalued, it's a 4% cap rate, it's a 5% cap rate, I'd be like, but that sounds great. I mean, you're talking about like stable 93% occupied New York City multifamily, like that's, it's an inflation protected asset at three and three quarters. Like that sounds fantastic when you think about the stability of some of these things and the, the leverage points, they sound great. I think that real estate development actually was starting to come back in the banking sector um, so Stephen and I have done, uh, when I was in a different role, we've done business on some of the great projects that Stephen has developed. And uh, why we did that also was there was an opportunity because a lot of banks moved out of this space. And if you wanted to build something that costs 20 to 30 million, your local bank would say, sure, I know you, I know the block you're talking about, I know the zoning there, that sounds like a great idea, I will lend. If you wanted to borrow 200 million, if you wanted to borrow a billion to build a building, that became more challenging. And there was great opportunity there for a little while because there wasn't this, like, you might come to us, you might go to Starwood, you might go to Blackstone. There's lots of names, but just a, a few that everybody knows. Hopefully one of those that everybody knows is J.P. Morgan. But um, there was only a few places to go to. And that had changed a lot, actually, through a lot of work with, uh, with developers, with, uh, with borrowers, with customers. People said, you know what, it's okay if we're gonna put our equity in first and then borrow, and if the borrowed money comes after the invested equity. And I think people in this room should think that that's a good structure also. It's not just good for the banks, it's good for the developers, because it's much less likely to get pulled away later. When things are built on kind of extracting options, sure, markets get super competitive, and then maybe underwriting standards deteriorate, or maybe just options get taken out. Maybe the borrower is able to say, I used to give you this fraud rep, and I'm not going to anymore. I used to give you this uh, a release pricing like this, and I'm not going to anymore. And they extract options. But it's an economic decision on a one-off basis, but for market stability, that's not really great, because it pushes things to a place where maybe when there's a bit of a bump to it, 
um, people don't participate anymore. So what I worry about a little bit is we have something like um, rates rally dramatically, and so therefore shouldn't um, borrowing rates come down in the same fashion, but they might not. You might just have banks saying, you know, I'm, I'm not earning there enough. Like, I'm not sure, like, I, you, I'm going to be on this like list of corporate treasurers who put a whole lot of you know assets on the balance sheet at two percent, and then you know like it's like the unemployment club. Fast forward ten years forward, um, like people are going to look and see you know should we be putting assets on the balance sheet at these kinds of rates? Maybe the flight to quality doesn't get passed through to borrowing rates. Um, so we are you know eyes wide open, looking for outcomes. And you know, ultimately, like our job is, we're looking at um, protecting the income of the bank. But how do we um, continue to serve our clients throughout, throughout, throughout? Like half of my job is making sure that every business in the bank, like they go serve their customers with the premise, it's not true, but they go serve their customers with the premise that we have unlimited capital and we don't, that we, like that we have unlimited funds and we don't. We have a lot and we're fortunate to, and we have a great franchise and great customers, but. Um, that's how they go about serving their customers, and it's my job to make sure that they can do that, they feel that way. And then separately, when we see the same way you would run your businesses and you say, I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm going to do less of this and a lot more of that. That's kind of like what I do um, with our balance sheet. So when we look at, I think we started off with supply chains, right? You asked me a question about supply chains. I showed a video and talked about um, <laughs> Which, like... You know, for anyone who knows me in the room, is I'm, I'm the least chatty person in the world, too. So, like, <laughs> this is probably you're getting, like, a week's worth of talking out of me. Um, I, I would say all these things matter. You're supposed to be prepared for this. You're supposed to be thinking about um, an economy like we have, which is not a government-driven, mandated policy economy, um, where there are more sole proprietors, more small businesses. What happens when, think about your own businesses. Some of you might work at a company like I do, where you get a paycheck every two weeks, there's a giant payroll company. A lot of you have your own businesses or participate in smaller businesses. And when you say, it's not just about, I can't fill this order now, because at some point it becomes, I haven't filled these orders, I haven't made the profit, that's bad, but I still need to pay the rent, I still need to pay utilities, I still need to pay my employees, I still need to pay for my life. And that becomes real. So we um, and you know, various financial bodies are thinking about you know, what could that look like? What do we have to do to prepare for that? Um, so you know, on one hand, it's um, what is the subtraction of GDP when um, this airline says we're no longer flying to these three countries for the next six weeks? On the other, it is uh, what, might, what could happen that we need to make sure we're prepared for? And it's, you know, all of that. And I think that's the part where maybe like not being an economist and you know, not being an epidemiologist and not being any of these things allows you to sort of step back and just try to be a business person and think about how we're preparing for our customers and what could happen and making sure that we're in dialogue and preparing for um, you know, what could happen in the market, what could happen next. Um, because you can draw a lot of things to say like, we've had moves like this every couple of years for the last 10 years this is not unusual in terms of the amount that markets have moved. What is unusual is how high the equities are, markets are moving from and how low a level of rates we are, are moving from. So it just like everything, you know, so many things we've gone through for the last 10 years or so, it's gonna be the, the first time we deal with this kind of thing. I Question. can't I can't believe you think that people are not interested in what you have to say. I'm not, I mean, like, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not interested in what I have to say, but I'm, so. I'm, uh, I'm, by the way, Manny's going to ask me for your cell number so he can call you every day and get advice, which, by the way, is what I'm going to do. So interest rates are critical to the real estate people in this audience. Yeah. Matt, give people a, an indication of what's happening in the credit markets today, CMBS, floaters, all, all of that. and. Where, how you see that playing out? Uh, because credit is cheap interest rates are great for the real estate developer, but yeah. the transmission of that credit is, is, is probably what people are thinking about today. And, and that's, what we're, that's a great question. That's what we're thinking about as well, is how does that flow through? Right now, the credit markets have been relatively stable. Um, the, the moves that we've seen in credit spreads have been um, 
not that dramatic, not nearly as large as what we saw in 2016 in some pockets. And again, we're talking about, um, you know, 10-year AAA CMBS went from 75 to right now there's a couple of deals out there that are working to get done at 95. So 20 basis points. Like, not, that's not the end of the world. By the way, we were there, you know, three or four weeks ago, and we kind of moved for, for different reasons. Um, and we've been much wider. So we kind of advise people to step back from that. Like, I, I kind of always think it's a, a bad idea if you're, if you're a developer, if you're a borrower, and you're saying, like, well, spreads just widened, so I don't really think I want to borrow here. I'm like, yeah, okay. So the spreads widened 20 basis points, but the underlying rate rallied 60. So who's winning there? You know, I think maybe sometimes you're just supposed to step back and look like, wh where am I borrowing? And a little less relative to everybody else. Um, the markets have been relatively resilient right now. Um, but, you know, as things go further, I think we will go through pockets where people say, like the prudent thing that people will do in a lot of spaces, they'll say, yeah, I agree with you. Like, you've all seen it where people say, I agree with you. Sounds like a great project. I agree with you. I think your deal's going to be terrific. I agree with you. I think your structure's fantastic. And um, I hope it's successful for you. <laughs> you know, and I encourage you in your pursuit. And um, we should get drinks sometime soon, right? Like, you, you've all been part of those conversations. And, and people will do that a little bit. They'll say, like, it's only been, I mean, it's only been five weeks, really, kind of from where we are today to where um, this really started to impact markets. It's not that long. And now it's popping up in Africa. It is, uh, there is a, there's a, a process that people are going to want to see. And not too many people have a framework built around how do I operate at 1% 10-year notes and 25 basis point two-year note. The, the two-year note one is a little bit easier because um, you're like, oh, okay, well, two years later. No matter what happens there, two years later, like, uh, I'll get another bite at this. But when you talk about the 10-year note at approximately 1%, Again, when people say, like, that's crazy, I would ask the question a little bit differently, or I would just ask people to think about things this way, like, what's the counterfactual? So when I spoke at um, um, a, a big asset manager asked me, when I was still in the investment bank, they asked me to come speak to their, like, secular forum that they did every six to 12 months to de decide what their next year's plan was going to be. And they said, you know, when do you think the cycle's gonna end? When do you think we're, and, and, I, and I was like, at, this was a few years ago. I was like, oh, three years. And they were like, oh my God, this is, this is like heresy. How could you say this? And I said, well, well, I'm not sure what you're really asking. Are you asking when, are you actually asking when we will have a recession? Because do you think we're going to have one next year? Everyone in the room agrees no. So why is two to three years so crazy? But also, if you're asking when will spreads widen, when my credit markets change their pricing, that's a different kind of question. So if you're saying the 10 year note is, that 1%, like it feels bad, but there's a part of it that if I said, how many people in the room think that the Fed is gonna hike interest rates sometime in the next five years? Actually, let's try that. How many people in the room think that the Fed's gonna hike interest rates in the next five years? A third? I might have conditioned the audience a little bit with the way it was a like, little bit of a leading question, but think about it a little different. So that was like a third. But maybe it was two-thirds would have actually answered yes if I hadn't asked it in that way or kind of set it up that way. But even still, like, this was, we were hiking, you know, a year ago. And this idea that we, but if I rephrase that and say, how many people think the Fed's going to hike sometime in the next 24 months? Let's try that. How many people think the Fed's going to hike in the next 24 months? A lot less hands. A lot less hands. And maybe they're right, right? I mean, you could, maybe they come out with a vaccine quickly and maybe this is over as, I hope, it's over as quickly as it started. I don't really feel that way. Um, but when you ask like the other way of thinking about it, like what's the opposite, you know? Do you think that rates are going to zero? You can have a long debate around that. But I think you can have a little bit of more consensus around you think that the Fed's going to hike in knowing what you know now in 21 or 22. And then you start to build in. Well, if I'm going to, and, and I think they will cut. So if you're going to be at lower rates for a couple of years, like you've got 10 years on this bond. So if a couple of years you're kind of earning a half a point, then, you know, at the back, you better be getting like three something percent. By the way, it's supposed to kind of be positive to inflation. Um, so... A lot open for interpretation right now. <laughs> <laughs>
I got a lot of questions, but, but we're at the zero hour, Manny. Are we opening it up to questions f from the audience? Or maybe I could just ask Matt to comment on one thing, elections. What's, what's your view and how? Clock's at zero. <laughs> Look, I think that's a really challenging question. Um, I, um, I think there's a long distance to travel between now and then. I think that people see a lane, perhaps. If you look at um, what typically happens, a lot of times the front runner, not too long after, is not the front runner anymore. Um, you know, I think I can say this as someone who lives in New York and is Jewish, like having like a, 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 like a billionaire, like a New York Jewish billionaire, like enter the race late stages is not your typical candidate, right? It does, like it, but I think that um, what, what I personally see as uh, a problem that came out of the last election among, I'm sure people in the room have lots and lots of views going in all sorts of directions though, is that people were told how they were supposed to think about it. And then you had people said like, oh, well, you didn't understand, oh, maybe I did. Maybe I voted with my feet, maybe I voted with my checkbook. Maybe I voted because one thing struck a chord with me. Maybe I voted because I didn't like the other person or something, but there was like this, um, like perception that people um, voted, that people voted because they didn't understand. And maybe that's just like a little bit narrow. And whether it was the outcome that people wanted or not, like generally large populations of the company voted, uh, of the country voted a certain way or voted the other way. Um, and the opinions of what the other side were doing were very, very strong. I think in general it's, it's divisive. I think that people, um, are looking for someone that they can believe in. I think that, um, you know, having nothing around, like, who I, I would want to win, um, I think that it's going to be hard to, to beat Trump unless the Democrats get their act together a little bit. Um, and there's, I, I wonder whether, like, can Bernie Sanders has a chunk of votes, but, like, does that actually grow? And I think there is this lane where pe someone could come in, maybe someone emerges. I think there are people like um, Senator Klobuchar who's sort of kind of biding her time a little bit um, and coming through. And, and you know, some of it is like, I think what just bugs me a little bit is the political theater to it. You know, I happen to have, um, you know, as, as just thought of it because I'm in Florida, like we had a lunch with Jeb Bush, maybe like 10 of us, and I don't know what the going opinion of, of Jeb Bush is, but I had never met him. And I was like, this is one of the smartest people I've ever met. I mean, his recall, history, politics, who voted on this, what happened, how it used to work. And I'm like, this man knows governing. This man knows governance. This man knows government and he knows history. I don't think he knows politics. And like, he doesn't know a whole lot about charisma. And, and that has a lot to do with what sort of, like there's a big element of it that I think is, is political theater that I think is unfortunate. And I think what the country is looking for is someone they feel that they can believe in. And it might be a process that takes more than one administration, more than one um, round of votes um, to, to move through the way Washington used to work to the way I think people hope that it could in the future. I would just encourage you know people to to, to make a choice. That, I think, is a very appropriate time to say that now you have lots of things to discuss in our first networking break. And thank you very much for being so open about the future.